can get started. We are super excited about this session. That's why I stopped her really quickly because I wanted to be able to tell you all of the great things about Teresa. She began working in home with regional center families providing early intervention services. She attended Ball State University where she attained her master's degree in applied behavior analysis and went on to receive her certification as a board certified behavior analysis. Teresa has over 10 years of experience working with children with special needs parent education and early intervention. Her goal is to empower families through parent education and the use of applied behavior analysis strategies. Do you see why I wanted to introduce you? You have so many great things. I wanted everyone to know the great things about you. Okay, so today I'm talking about functional communication training. It is, uh, this is again, my background and my experience. I really love what I do. I've been in the field for over 10 years and I truly enjoy it. Um, one of the biggest things I do enjoy is working with families and training them on different strategies. Um, and functional communication training by far is one of the most simplest strategies that we can train our families on. Uh, during COVID, we were working a lot with our families via remote. And so we were having to train families how to teach their child to communicate and how to work on those behaviors and really get them to have that learning occur when we weren't physically there. So this was something that I was constantly pushing to families and training families on because it's such an easy strategy to use. So I wanted to introduce it to everybody and go through it. So we'll talk about what functional communication training is. So when we're talking about functional communication training, it, it is basically what it sounds like in the title. We're looking at what is the function and what's the purpose, what my child is trying to communicate. And essentially, if we can train kids a form of communication, whether that be pointing, gesturing, um, we have some kids who use AAC devices, uh, even things such as pulling parents to an area. If we can train them to do some of these skills, then a lot of those challenging behaviors will fall to the wayside. We find that a good portion of behaviors that are engaged in by learners are most often a result of them not being able to communicate. Uh, I think about myself in another country. If I were not able to communicate that I was hungry, that I needed to use the restroom, that I was frustrated, um, it would definitely make people upset and it would be a challenge to do daily living things. So really with functional communication training, we try to determine what's the function? What is my learner trying to communicate? And then we try to teach a replacement behavior because oftentimes our kids will learn some challenging behaviors to communicate and that's not necessarily what we want them to be doing. We want them to be able to communicate appropriately. So when we look at the fundamentals, we're trying to reinforce responses and behaviors that we want to see more often. So we're looking at pointing, oh, sorry, click on the pointing, using words, using gestures, um, gaining attention appropriately from others. But we also want to place some of those behaviors on extinction. So things that we don't want our learner to do anymore, things that we don't want them to engage in, it would be things like you know, screaming at mom or yelling in the kitchen when they want a certain snack, um, throwing items because they want access to the iPad and somebody said no more iPad time. So we want to work on getting rid of some of those bad behaviors, but also reinforcing good behavior. So our learner sees, oh, this is actually easier than me getting upset and I can use this as my outlet. So in order to implement functional communication training, we often had to train parents on the functions of behavior functional equivalence, teaching them how to choose a replacement behavior. So that's really based on your learner and then extinction strategies. So we're going to go through all of these to make sure that you have a strong grasp on them. And that way it's easier for you to train your families on this. So the functions of behavior is very much like a fundamental part of applied behavior analysis and what I do every day in working with kids, especially kids on the spectrum. Uh, when we look at functions of behavior, it basically states that we can determine the function of behavior and we can kind of fit it into one of these categories, if not more than one of these categories. So any type of behavior is exhibited or done for a specific reason. So sometimes we do behavior for sensory. This is any time we want something to feel good or it smells good or it tastes good. So sometimes people just don't even drink their coffee. They just like the smell of coffee and it wakes them up in the morning. Sometimes we enjoy certain sounds while we're doing our work or while we have that background noise. 
for kids on the spectrum, it could be rocking or moving in their seat. It could be having a small enclosed space to sit in while they do work or while they learn. So really you have kids who engage in sensory seeking behavior and oftentimes it could be self-interest. It could be inappropriate sensory seeking behavior. And we wanna teach them what's the appropriate way to get access to this sensory behavior that you want. You have behaviors such as attention seeking. So it's any behavior that we use to gain attention from others. So in adults, you'll see people post crazy pictures. You'll see them dye their hair crazy colors. Um, but we also have appropriate ways of gaining attention like reaching out to a friend or tapping an adult, calling mom, um, making eye contact, giving praise to others. So you're seeking attention in appropriate ways. For escape and avoidance, it's any type of behavior that we use to get out of doing something that is not our favorite. So it could be so simple as not even driving by my gym because I don't want to go to the gym today. It could be for some of our learners saying that they have to use the restroom because they don't want to work on this challenging task or activity, especially in a classroom setting. It could be my learner pretending to sleep because he doesn't want to work on his sight words. So you really have a lot of different behaviors. You want to see things more appropriate, like I need a break, or I'm all done, or this is too hard, right? Then you have tangibles. So kids who engage in, tan in behaviors to gain access to specific things. So the best example I give for this one is the kid that you see at Target who's throwing a fit because he wants that candy bar in the aisle. And mom is saying, no, we can't have it. And he throws a fit and eventually mom gives in. He learns that that's the way that we communicate. I scream and I kick and I get access to that candy bar and that's my communication. So teaching learners to request access to things, teaching them to use their words, but also teaching them to tolerate sometimes when no means no and we can't have access to that right now. It's not available right now. So these are your four functions of behavior. I love the functions of behavior and I think it's crucial to understand as a professional, as uh, a parent educator, even as parents, it's such a huge help because our parents start to identify and look at a behavior as a whole versus, oh my God, this behavior is exhausting. And why is he tantruming? And I just can't anymore. I feel like, especially during COVID, our parents were really struggling to manage and to deal with the kids all day long. And we had to say, well, let's look at this behavior a little bit deeper. Let's figure out what he's trying to communicate and let's give him some functional communication. So essentially functions of behavior are amazing because not only can you apply them to your younger learners, it's all the way up until adulthood. I can classify anybody's behavior. And sometimes you have dual functions where I'm escaping and avoiding because I need some sensory or I'm trying to get your attention because I need access to a tangible. So these are awesome and great to train your parents in because again, it gives them a bigger picture. So once we train parents on functions of behavior, then I get them to break it down and understand the behavior in its entirety. So I teach them to take a little bit of data, which is scary um, because some parents are like, I have to track things and I have to write it down and I have homework now. But essentially it gives them a sense of purpose. It gives them a sense of looking at the big picture. So we teach them to do the ABCs of behavior. So the ABCs of behavior look like this. You have an antecedent, you have your behavior and you have your consequence. So your ABCs, right? Your antecedent, we always have parents write down what happened before the behavior. So I don't want them to just look at the behavior and what exactly that looked like. I wanna know what happened before because oftentimes I can see if there's trends in what's happening before. I can see if it's, it's related to time because the behavior is always happening before dinner or after bath time, you know, especially if my learner knows routines you can see some of those trends. Then I have parents describe the behavior. So oftentimes when we ask a parent to describe a behavior, they describe it in very subjective terms, um, very much like he got mad, he got upset, you know, he had a meltdown and your idea of a meltdown versus my idea of a meltdown is very different. So I have to say, well, I need you to be more descriptive for me. I need you to give it to me in more specific terms. So did he hit? Did he scream? Did he cry? Did he bite? Um, so I really want to know what the behavior looked like, the severity of it, the intensity of it. Even in terms of duration, I ask parents, can you let me know how long that behavior lasted for? Um, because some parents will say, oh my God, it's so long. But when they really sit down and time it, it's a minute, two minutes, <laughs> which to us as professionals is not a big deal. But to parents, sometimes, especially when they're out at a restaurant, it is the most grueling two minutes ever to have everybody stare at you. 
Um, then I ask them to write down a consequence. So the consequence is what happened? What changed in the environment after the behavior? So directly after the behavior, did we cave? Did we give in? Did we hand him his iPad? Did we have to take him outside? Did we have to reprimand him? What changed in the environment? And possibly when we look at those changes in the environment, we can look at, well, every time he has a tantrum, you guys give him his iPad. Do you think that that's what is that cause and effect? There is that what's making him have those tantrums more frequently because then he gets access to all of his favorite things. So again, taking ABC data is a little scary for your parents. It takes a little bit of training. Uh, I often use some video models and I walk through them with parents and I'll show them some YouTube videos of tantrums and behaviors and certain things. And I say, okay, let's do this together. And we practice it. And then the following week we go through that ABC data that they took and we talk about some of those trends and some of those things that my learner's communicating. So again, it could look something like this. <clears throat> you have your antecedent, which the child sees the candy in the kitchen, right? Uh, the behavior is they're screaming, they're crying. And then ultimately your consequence ends up being that grandma goes in there and delivers that candy. I mean, we love grandmas, but grandmas are always <laughs> kind of giving in and making that learner, you know, use some of that inappropriate communication skills. So once grandma delivers that candy, the child knows, well, I don't need to say candy. I don't need to point to candy. I don't need to sign candy. I just get it because grandma gives it to me. And if I scream and cry, that's the cause and effect. Even for our learners who are very developmentally delayed, who have cognitive scores that are really low, they will make that connection of cause and effect. So we have to kind of look at some of these ABCs and, and explain to parents, this is why we're here and it's a learned behavior, but it's not impossible to unlearn. It's not impossible to teach something new to our kid to get them to functionally communicate. So when we look at that term functional equivalence, it serves the same purpose. So whether he says candy or he screams and cries in the kitchen, we're still getting candy, right? And for some of our learners, it's easier to scream and cry, especially our kids who struggle with language development and forming those words. And maybe he tried to form that word, but nobody understood him the first time. So guess what? I'm going to scream and cry and here comes grandma. So getting, getting some of that ABC data is super helpful because it gets parents to look at their own behavior. Just like in that last uh, training, they said, we don't change the environment or we don't change the child. We change the environment this is that piece is I have to have parents look at their own behavior before they look at their child's behavior. And this is essentially them looking at their behavior. It's a little trick. <laughs> so when we look at behavior for a lot of our learners, especially in early education and for kids that have speech delays or even things like speech apraxia, uh, Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, all of those developmental delays, our behavior is often their form of communicating. So our learners are constantly engaging in behaviors to get their point across and to get their needs met. Um, but as parents and caregivers, we have to kind of step back and look at the behavior as a whole and figure out what is my child trying to communicate? So once we determine with parents and we do some of that ABC data, it's really beneficial for us to look and see what kind of trends there are, what kind of things are consistent across the board. So I might say, he oftentimes is really trying to get your guys' attention and he has a lot of attention seeking behavior. So let's focus in that area, right? So if we're gonna focus in that area, then we start to think about, well, what kind of replacement behaviors can we choose for my learner? Because if my learner is nonverbal, non-vocal, um, is, you know, makes minimal eye contact, has very low joint attention, um, I don't necessarily wanna say, we're going to target words and he's going to say a word to get our attention. He's going to say mom or he's going to say look to get our attention. That's a really high goal. And it's not necessarily going to be achievable in, in enough time because I want something that's quick and easy to teach my learner or quick and easy to shape with my learner. So that way we can get rid of those bad behaviors. We can get them to communicate right away. So you want to choose something that's already in your learner's skill set. So that could be something as simple as pulling. Uh, a lot of our kids on the spectrum will do uh, pulling adults or placing an adult hand on an item that they would like. Initially, that's, that's an appropriate skill, but they might not generalize it to all things. So we'll teach our learner to do that for other things. We also want to look at what's quick and easy. So in ABA, we oftentimes use PECs, which are little visual icons. We also use AAC devices. Uh, which is the iPad with the icons that the learner can click and it'll say cookies, juice, ball, and they can request. Again, if we don't have those things readily available, 
we may not want to choose that because we've got to create that. We've got to create the material. We've got to create the AAC. We've got to do, you know, and work with speech to make sure that that's uh, appropriate. It's it's really, we want to see what's, what's quick and easy, right? Then for development. So what's appropriate for their development? You have parents who prompt a one-year-old to say, I want juice. That's not really within his developmental skill set. And so we want to make sure that we're reminding parents this is appropriate for his age level. And this is, you know, this is what we should be seeking or based on his skill set that he has now, this is where we should be going. We oftentimes have parents who want to work on phrases and my learner doesn't have enough words in their vocabulary to start working on phrases. So it's important to kind of take that development into consideration and then effort. Effort is the biggest thing because a lot of our learners want to do the least amount of effort. I don't want to work that hard to get my point across. I mean, if you think about us as adults, we're very much the same. We're going to take the easiest route possible. So really making sure that it doesn't take a lot of effort for my learner. You have kids that have speech and language disorders and apraxia, and sometimes it's hard for them to get that message across. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the effort that it requires my learner when I choose that replacement behavior. So there's a lot of different communication forms that we should consider. Um, a lot of parents always, when I say, what's your goal for your child's communication? It's words. I want them to talk. Um, but there's a lot of things that happen in the natural development of language that we need to consider. So, you know, your child should be using gestures. They should be tapping others to get attention. They should be, you know, using different types of gestures like waving hi or bye or blowing kisses because those are meaningful gestures. Even making eye contact and having that joint interaction is important. So really educating parents that it doesn't necessarily just have to be words. Some of your kids have not vocalized or said anything. We might need to look at alternative methods of communication such as pecs or visuals. Uh, things like sign language are great to teach some of our learners and an AAC device, it's always super important to let your families know that these forms of communication, the alternative methods, don't necessarily mean that your learner will be stuck there forever. All of the research shows that AAC devices, PECs and visuals and sign language only help to strengthen language long-term. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a crutch or a forever solution, but I tell parents, we need to find a solution for now because he's frustrated and he can't communicate. And we need to make sure that we're giving him that opportunity to let us know what he wants and needs on a daily basis. So there's a lot of different communication forms to consider and we don't always just have to go straight to words and phrases. So when we look at behaviors, I made this chart uh, to, to help explain to parents, you know, especially if we're looking at a kid who fits in one of these categories quite often and we'll go through different examples. Because again, we still have to look at the behavior that they're doing and put it on extinction, meaning I don't want to reinforce it anymore. He's not going to get access to that item if he engages in this behavior. He has to do the replacement behavior, which may require that we prompt the learner to do it, that we remind them, hey, you need to ask for a break, right? So for things like sensory, uh, sensory is that input that they receive that feels good, tastes good, smell good, right? So sometimes to put that behavior on extinction, we have to change the consequence. We have to interrupt it. We have to block it from happening. So for a kid who likes to jump on the couch or is a very movement based kid, you know, our learners who just need to run and have ants in their pants constantly, that's totally fine, but I don't want them necessarily to jump on a couch. So parent might block them from jumping on the couch or sometimes sit on the couch so that they can't access jumping on it. And we might redirect that child to jumping on a trampoline, but also to replace it and to get them to communicate that they have that need. We might have them use a visual to request for jumping time to request for trampoline. Uh, we might have them do a sign to say jump, to let us know that they wanna jump. So again, we're teaching them, here's how you communicate what you want and need with us and it'll get you access to some of your favorite things, right? Then you have escape and avoidance. So again, if we're looking at our COVID learners, our remote learners, um, this is, you know, an example would be a child who closes the laptop during remote learning. Um, they don't want to do it anymore. They're sick of it, which I don't blame them. But parent opens the laptop and they don't allow the learner to escape. They say, we have to finish this, right? So we're denying that opportunity for a break, but we can also teach that learner to functionally communicate. I need a break. So he could use the sign for break. He could say break. We oftentimes will create a little visual icon that's a break card or a stop card so that that way they can communicate. I need to step away from this. I'm exhausted 
which is very normal and very typical, even for adults. It's hard to sit through all of these trainings and not walk away for something to drink, eat, take a break, right? Attention seeking behaviors. You may have the child who screams to get mom's attention and mom has to ignore that behavior, which is super hard for our parents to ignore that behavior, but they have to. So we do what's called planned ignoring. That's your extinction procedure. And we might prompt that learner to tap mom or to say mom, right? So while they're screaming, we're reminding them you need to you need to say mom or you need to tap her. So oftentimes when we're teaching these replacement behaviors, super helpful to have a shadow or another adult present to prompt your learner and remind them, hey, you need to say mom. Uh, then you have tangible. So that's that child who you know wants iPad time and we're denying the iPad. We're removing it. We're saying it's not available right now. Um, so we have to deny access. We can either work on that learner requesting iPad appropriately or we work on them tolerating that no, because sometimes iPad's not available or we just can't have iPad all day, right? So these are some examples that I go through with parents to really make them understand. They're very relatable examples <laughs> for a lot of our families. They're like, yes, that happens to me all the time with the iPad. Um, I think every parent has experienced that iPad meltdown. So I think hitting, hitting some of those examples really brings it home to them and shows them, okay, I can do this, I can work on this. So one of the ways that we were teaching parents in home to build communication and to create those opportunities for functional communication training was doing communication temptations. <clears throat> so oftentimes uh, parents are great parents. A lot of the families we work with are great moms and dads and they are very intuitive and they read their child's mind, which is awesome. Uh, but also because they read their child's mind, they are constantly providing access to things without the child communicating. So if a learner was roaming around in the kitchen, mom would say, oh, he's hungry. And she'd grab him a snack. And I'd say, well, how do you know he's hungry? And she said, well, he usually goes and stands in the kitchen when he's hungry. And I said, yeah, but he didn't say he was hungry. Like, what if he's thirsty? Like, maybe we offer him a choice. Maybe you have him, you know, use his icons. We've got to have a way for him to communicate to somebody else when you're not there, because what happens when you're not there? Nobody knows how to read his mind. So we would teach parents to use communication temptations because they already had these routines and they already were reading their child's mind. So we would say, you know, mom, I just want you to pretend like you don't know. Just play dumb for a little bit and let's see if he'll troubleshoot this and he'll find a way to communicate it. Uh, another thing that we do would, would, would be to do chains and routines. So creating those chains and routines or even the routine language. So we would say, okay, we're going to wash our hands and we scrub, scrub, scrub. And then we turn off the and mom always says, turn off the water. But instead of mom saying the full phrase, she'll pause. And then the learner will jump in and say, water. And then we'll get some of that communication out. So having some of those routines that parents have embedded, will tell parents, I want you to stop and wait and see if he'll ask for the next part of the routine or wait and see if he'll vocalize to get access to that next routine. Uh, closed containers. So I would have parents put items inside of Tupperware bins because then my learner has to ask for help. They have to ask for access to the items that are inside the container. Um, putting items out of reach, so putting things up high so they had to ask for access to them. Um, anytime you have the world at your fingertips, you don't necessarily do a lot of work. So really making sure that parents understood that. Um, I would tell parents to enjoy things without offering it. So if my learner was in the kitchen and he wanted chips, I would tell mom, you know, I want you to get the chips out and be like, mm, I'm going to eat some chips and then kind of enjoy them without offering and wait and see if he throws that word out there without mom directly prompting and saying, can you say chips or tell me chips? Mom would just say, oh, these chips are so yummy and I love them. And sure enough, our learner would come around and either use his sign for chips or try to approximate chips. And then the other option would be missing pieces. So we'll, we would engage in an activity where maybe my learner loves trains. We would give him all the pieces to the train set, but then we didn't give him the trains or he was missing parts of his train and he knew it because he loved that train set. So he had to ask like, where is it? Or he had to ask for the missing pieces. And that again, created a communication opportunity. So communication temptations are great, easy to teach parents, especially our parents who are way too intuitive and way too good of parents that they're just constantly giving in. It's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. So when we're teaching replacement behaviors, I created these different slides to go through and discuss different options on if you determined your function of behavior, these are some options of replacement behaviors. So for our escape kiddos, we could teach them to say all done. We could teach them to use a break visual. We could also teach them to shake their head no. So if I presented 
an activity that he hated and I knew he hated, I would just remind him, all you got to do is shake your head no and I'll take it away. It's all done. Um, we would also teach our learners to push the items away. Um, I would also use toy bins or bags. So we use a lot of Ziploc bags with our toys. So oftentimes if my learner didn't want to do something, if I laid out all the items and he started to put them away, I would say, oh, you're cleaning up. That means you're all done. Okay. And I would accept that as his form of communication. And we would slowly shape that into something more. But even that just as a bare minimum is huge for some of our learners. Uh, reminding them that they can ask for help. So oftentimes our kids like to escape behaviors because it's, it's or escape tasks because they're hard. Um, I have a learner specifically who just really dislikes fine motor activities. He's not great at tracing or drawing. And so anytime those activities come out, he, you know, we have to remind him, if you need some help, we can help you just ask, you know, but once he realizes he has help, he will go through the activity and he will engage in it. But that, that difficulty is hard for him. Um, offering scheduled breaks is huge. Our learners need breaks. And sometimes our, our families or even professionals are pushing learners way past their actual attending time. So if I'm having a learner sit at a table for 30 minutes, it's just, it's too much to ask. So I need to be aware of that. I need to schedule breaks. I can use timers to signify when those breaks need to happen. And we don't necessarily need to clean up that item. I just say, oh, let's get up and take a break or let's get up and move. Let's get up and do our wiggles dance. Um, and then the other option would be cleaning up is them helping that cleanup process. Uh, teaching replacement behaviors for access. So my learner's trying to gain access to things. One, I have to teach them to accept no because the answer can't always be yes. Even though he's learned how to say cookie and I love that he says cookie. And in the beginning, I tell parents, you gotta give him a cookie. You gotta give him at least a piece of cookie because he's worked really hard to learn this word. But then at some point we have to kind of slow down the rate of giving him cookies. So every once in a while we have to say, mm, you can't have a cookie. Um, so we have to tell them, you know, no, and they have to learn to accept it. But we can also provide alternative choices. You can't have a cookie, but you can have apples or a banana. We also prime our learners. So letting them know when they can have it. Like you can't have cookie right now, but after dinner, you can have a cookie. Um, you would be so amazed at if you give your child more information, if you let them know what's going to happen next behaviors typically are not an issue. Uh, we also had the option to kind of create an unavailable bin. So for some of our learners who are more nonverbal and nonvocal, who have a harder time understanding that priming piece, we would place items in a red bin. And in the red bin, that means they're not available and we can't have them right now. But items that were in the green bin or items that weren't in the red bin, he could have, they were good to go, right? So even having that visual for that child is huge. Um, visual schedules are awesome to use with some of our learners who are nonverbal or even just to organize some of our kids, but a visual schedule when that's available. So iPad is huge, especially over the summer with our families. So a lot of our families, I said, okay, if you want to limit iPad time, let's put it on the schedule. So after we eat snack, then you can have iPad time. But in the morning when we're getting ready, when we're, you know, the teachers here, we're not going to do iPad time. Having that visual schedule is important because if he asks for it, you can go and remind him, look, we're not there yet, but we're almost there. We're going to get there. And then that pre-MAC principle. So first this, then that. Such an easy skill and strategy for our parents to use. Um, first, you have to eat. Then you can have your iPad. First, you have to finish your homework. Then you can have your iPad. Um, it's a very easy phrase to use. And it's as long as you're a parent who sticks to your word, your kids will kind of follow along with that. And it's, it's, so, it's so great to use. <clears throat> and then for attention seeking behaviors, we could teach things like um, non contingent attention. So I have to often teach my parents that they need to give more attention to the learners uh, when they're not doing bad things. <laughs> As parents, we oftentimes are quick to respond to bad behavior and to jump in and say, hey, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Versus when they're doing good things, everybody's like, hey, don't don't say anything to him. He's playing by himself. He's doing good. And that's the exact opposite. You want to say, wow, I like how you're playing with your cars. Good job. Um, so we really want to give more of that non-contingent attention. Uh, we want to model ways to get attention. So that means we practice how we get their attention. We tap them. We say their name often so that we're modeling those appropriate ways. You want to reinforce all good attempts. So if he doesn't always tap you as gently, if he says your name and it's sometimes wrong, we have some kids who call mom, everybody. We want to reinforce it because at least he's making an attempt, but we can eventually shape it. Like, I'm not mom, I'm teacher, but yes, what do you need? Um, 
We also teach that contingent attention. So I'm going to give you attention for doing good things. I'm going to give you attention for following the rules or listening so that they learn to kind of do those behaviors more often. Uh, we can schedule. I oftentimes have to tell parents, especially I live in California, and it's very much a dual working household for a lot of the families we work with. So when kids have their parents come home after a long day of work, our parents are exhausted and they're just like, oh, I'm tired. And they don't necessarily get to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with their kid. And I have to say, you've got to spend at least 15 minutes of just one-on-one -on -one mommy and me, daddy and me time, because as soon as you get home, they're seeking that attention. And if you don't give it to them right away, it's going to be bad behavior. Or if you don't say, hey, let me put my stuff down, let me change my clothes, and then I'm going to come play with you then our learners typically engage in the negative attention seeking behaviors and you don't want that you can kind of you can kind of set yourself up for success and then teaching them a variety of ways to gain attention is, is important because not everybody responds to their name not everybody responds to you tapping so teaching them that there's different ways to get our attention is always big <clears throat> uh, for sensory seeking so for our learners who are sensory seeking and are looking for that input we oftentimes have to figure out what the input is. And sometimes this might require us to try out the behavior. So what does he get from spinning? What does he get from looking at this object while laying down? Uh, what feeling, what does this feel like? And how can I mimic this feeling? Um, so one of the things my learner likes to do is he gets on the trampoline and the, the fabric of the trampoline, he likes to rub on his face, but he likes to go on the outside, which is kind of dangerous. Um, so once we figured out, okay, he likes this scratchy texture material, that's okay. But we also were able to get a replacement fabric that was similar and give it to him when he was outside of the trampoline and not standing outside of it very dangerously. Um, and we were able to provide that input on a different in a different way. So it wasn't as dangerous and scary. Uh, we had to, you have to also have to like choose your battles uh, with sensory things. Sometimes my learners just need to move. Sometimes they just need to, to run and I need to look at that and realize that that needs to happen in order for my learner to sit and work and learn for the next 15 minutes, he's got to run. So we have to choose our battles. You know, we don't want to change every sensory seeking behavior because they need that to regulate. They need it to focus. And we as adults have certain sensory behaviors that we need to focus. So we have to realize that. Uh, we make adjustments for safety because I want to make sure that my learner is safe. Uh, we oftentimes are collaborating with other professionals. So occupational therapists, are great to collaborate with because they have a they are all part of that sensory seeking realm. So really getting an understanding from their perspective and then collaborating with them is awesome. Sensory should be fun. So we want to keep things fun. We want them to experience the world around them and explore. And then we want to offer a variety of different options. So we had given him that fabric that he really enjoyed, but we also threw in other fabrics in there that he also started to enjoy, which were like the fuzzy fabrics or the sequin fabric that changes colors he's all about now. Um, so we were able to kind of find more things that he was into and then use those to get him to communicate, which was big. <clears throat> uh, the last thing that we had really focused on with our families, and I really honed in on families with during, you know, remote training and getting parents to do things on their own was really doing language during routines. Um, we have these routines embedded in our day, whether it was you know a morning routine or an evening routine and parents are not utilizing them as well as they could to get language out of their learners. So for my kids who like to get dressed and get ready in the morning, you know, some of our learners want specific clothing. They wanna wear a certain shirt that has their favorite Sonic character on it, which is totally fine. But I would say offer them choices and let them communicate what they want. Uh, during playtime, a lot of our learners like things a specific way during play. So teaching them it's my turn or it's my way was a big a way to kind of build some of that communication, even during breakfast, requesting food items, telling parents that they're all done or that they want more of that specific food item. So any mealtime, we were looking at how do we get more communication in here and wait, mom, don't give him more juice. Give it a second so he can troubleshoot this. Um, outdoor play, a lot of our kids, especially during COVID, just wanted to be outside because we were kind of cooping them up inside. So really teaching parents, you know, what were some outdoor activities to do and how could we get our learner to request them during social play? How could we get our learner to ask for the things that they wanted from another peer or play partner? How could we get them to ask for their turn or to ask for a learner to do something for them, like push me, whether it be on a swing or in a wagon? 
Um, and then even that winding down bedtime routine, what book do we want to read? Uh, do we want to take a bath first or do we want to read first? Uh, really getting your learner to communicate. And even in those chains of let's brush our teeth, I would tell parents, okay, give him the toothbrush and see if he asks for the toothpaste because he knows that that's next, but is he going to ask for it? Or is he just going to stand there and look at you? <laughs> and so getting parents to kind of embed communication into their language routines or into their daily routines was huge because we just saw a big rise in communication across the board from our learners, but also you see your parents build this confidence, build this understanding of, I can do this on my own and this is easy. And I didn't know that this was how easy it was. Um, you know, I worked in early intervention and the regional center and we would go into families' homes and they would watch what we do and they'd be like, oh, it's so amazing. You guys are so great. We, you, I don't know how you get him to talk so much. I can't get him to do it. And I think COVID was kind of a blessing in disguise for my program because we realized we need to have parents doing more. We need to have them facilitate more because if they, if we look at the amount of time that we spend with the child versus the time that the parents do, it's so substantial the amount of time that they are working with their kid or that they are living and engaging with their kid. And if they could learn to do some of these strategies and learn to implement, we really saw such a huge increase in skills and language learned and words learned and just engagement and happiness overall for our families, for the kids. So I can't stress this, this type of strategy enough because it was so easy to get our families to do. So on the back end, you know, we worked with families on different tips and tricks. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our families we noticed were a little tough on our kids and we had to remind them, you have to reinforce attempts. Um, even though bubbles is bubbas and it's not that close to bubbles and, you know, or maybe he just does buh, buh for bubbles. We have to kind of reinforce that attempt because language in the beginning is hard. It is a little bit challenging and we really wanna make sure that our learners are you know, reinforce that they want to continue trying, that they want to be engaged with us. So we had to teach our parents to, to, you know, reinforce the attempts. Um, we had to teach our parents to be persistent, but patient. So oftentimes we would teach them these strategies and they would say, well, I tried it yesterday. It didn't work. And we had to say, no, you got to try it again. You have to do it a few times and let's, let's run it again and let's practice it together. Um, we did a lot of video modeling. We did a lot of modeling and practice in the session with them. And this, a lot of it was via remote. So that's why parent coaching and parent education, I feel like is such a big piece in early education. It's huge in order to see that progress in your learner. Um, so we had to teach them to be persistent, but also to be patient, to just kind of give that learner a little bit of time to process and even just delay prompts. Uh, you have a lot of moms, especially who want to help the kid and they don't want to see them struggle. So mom is like, just say cookie, say it, say it, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 mom, give him a minute. He's got to think about it. Let him troubleshoot it. And a lot of our learners would surprise us if we delayed those prompts. If we waited, you know, five to 10 seconds, they would figure it out. <clears throat> and then teaching our parents to know the function. So oftentimes we would have them record a behavior or we would have them um, we would, we would see a behavior happen in the session and we would test the parents. Like, what's the function of this behavior? And tell me why you think that's the function. And okay, let's figure out like, so what's motivating this behavior, really getting them to understand because once they understood the behavior, it didn't, it wasn't as taxing on our families. It wasn't as exhausting. They had the tools and the strategies to combat some of those behaviors. So a lot of our families were more hands-on parents that prior to our training, and dads who weren't as hands-on were all of a sudden really hands-on, really confident, uh, ready to kind of, okay, I'm ready to run session today. I have these activities. And it was awesome to see um, just getting our parents to build that confidence in themselves that they knew the function, they knew what their child was communicating, and they knew how to get it to happen. So overall, I cannot stress functional communication enough. Um, <clears throat> in this piece and and in the process of doing all this, you know, I really wanted parents to understand that they're the professional, that they're the child's best teacher. And I think long-term as a professional, I've had families tell me, you know, you're the professional, so whatever you recommend, we're gonna do. And I, that kind of made me cringe the first time I heard it because I thought, yeah, I am the professional and I do know what I'm doing, but you're the professional of your child. So I still need your input. I still need 
your information on this kid. I still need you to tell me if this sounds like it's going to work best for your child. So when we do functional communication training, it's never a one size fits all. You have to pick, you have to look at what your function is. You have to determine a replacement behavior that's appropriate for this child, because what's appropriate for one child may not be appropriate for the other. So really getting parents to understand, I need your input and I need your help here. And I need you to work with me on this because we're only as strong together as we are for your child and I need it. So really collaborating with parents was a huge part of doing functional communication training. These are all, these are some of the main references I used. Um, some of the research articles that go over functional communication training. So if you wanna take a screenshot of this and save it, I didn't have my chat box open. So if there were any chats, let me know if there's any questions that I could answer. I'm gonna to flip to the next slide in a minute. And then that just has my contact information. If you wanna contact me, if you want more information on this, you want, um, I'm, I'm open to sharing my slides. I know at the last training you guys were asking for, if you get a copy, I'm open to sharing my slides if you just reach out to me. And this is all my contact information. Uh, this is my personal email. This is Behavior Highway. That's the company that I run uh, the ABA clinic. So if you want more information, um, we're often releasing like educational stuff and stuff to train our parents and families. So feel free to reach out. And then Tisha, if there's any questions I didn't see in the chat, you let me know.